Although arguably the most famous insurance company in the world, its influence widely noted throughout history, Lloyds of London is really not an insurance company at all. It's an insurance market in which its brokers write policies in which syndicates and other parties called names share the financial risks of certain ventures. Born in a London coffee house in the 17th century, it remains steeped in tradition and history, though modern business practices have rendered many of its formal practices, if not obsolete, certainly quaint. Over the centuries, Lloyds has developed a reputation for integrity, for its ability and willingness to ensure virtually anything. Since 18th century ships ventured forth, investors in their voyages were protected by the financial umbrella offered by Lloyd's underwriters. The famed clipper ship Cutty Sark once sailed under Lloyd's protection. In the 20th century, a whiskey company of the same name used Lloyd's to protect another venture wholly different from the perils of the sea. Here are some of the more unusual, even bizarre items insured by the venerable Lloyd's of London, and some examples of the company honoring the claims of the insured. Number 10. Body Parts a wise craftsman recognizes the role of his tools in achieving success. In the case of Keith Richards, guitarist and songwriter for the legendary band The Rolling Stones, his hands are tools critical to his storied career. Gnarled, twisted, scarred, and arthritic, Richards' hands are insured by Lloyd's, and according to then-president of Lloyd's North America, Hank Watkins in 2016, they have been insured by them for a long time. Insuring body parts critical to success is nothing new. During World War II, actress and dancer Betty Grable, who displaced Rita Hayworth as the number one pin-up girl among American soldiers and sailors insured her legs for a million dollars. I've got two reasons for success, and I'm standing on both of them," Grable said. Irish dancer Michael Flatley insured his legs too, though not for the same reasons as Betty Grable. Lloyd's covered the risk. They also insured singer Tom Jones's chest hair, in case it should somehow be lost, adversely affecting his earning ability. Betty Davis, whom singer Kim Carnes lauded for her eyes, chose instead to insure her waistline, 21 inches. Dolly Parton was long reported to have insured a pair of assets through Lloyd's, though she later denied these claims. She explained them as a rumor arising over comments that she made regarding Grable's famously insuring her legs. Tom Jones likewise denied his chest air was insured, though as a publicity stunt, one never knows. Number 9. Automobile Insurance Though other insurance companies dispute them, Lloyd's claims to have issued the first automobile policy in 1904. At the time, the item being insured was described not as an automobile, but as a ship navigating on land. That phrase was used to describe the subject of the policy, which was identified as a motor car. Yet according to the insurance journal, Travelers Insurance sold an automobile insurance policy to a Dr. Truman Martin of Buffalo, New York in 1898. Dr. Martin owns one of the approximately 4,000 motor cars on American roads at the time. Another source assigns the first auto insurance policy to travelers, but claims it was issued in Dayton, Ohio in 1897, providing automobile owner Gilbert Loomis with $1,000 in liability coverage. Travelers' website claims its first policy in 1897 without specifying where and to whom it was issued. So, who knows? Lloyd's justifiably famous for maritime insurance at the turn of the 20th century resorted to nautical language in its early non-nautical policies and in 1910 forms the Non-Maritime Underwriters Association to address the emerging markets of automotive and aviation insurance. In 1919, Lloyd's underwriter Cuthbert Heath formed the British Aviation Insurance Association. In 1927, Heath wrote a policy for Lloyd's covering Charles Lindbergh's New York to Paris flight. The early aviation insurance policy would have provided its beneficiaries $18,000 had Lindy not proved so lucky. Number 8. Bruce Springsteen's Voice Whether one is a fan of the boss or not, one is likely to admit that his singing voice, while distinctive, does not rank with the great voices of all time. Pavarotti, he is not. Nor Sinatra, though Bruce is reportedly an unabashed fan of his fellow Jersey boy. Springsteen's reputation was built through his hard-working, hard-rocking E Street band and his songwriting with its empathy for the common man. Rolling Stone magazine called Springsteen the voice of the decade in a retrospective article published in November 1990, though they referred to his message rather than his singing voice, which could hardly be called mellifluous. Regardless, Bruce Springsteen's voice was insured by Lloyd's against the possibility of loss or damage which would inhibit his singing. The boss is certainly not the only performer to insure his vocal cords against potential loss of singing ability. Rod Stewart, Bob Dylan, and Mariah Carey all allegedly insure their voices. In the case of the latter, she also insured her legs. Evidently, Pavarotti did not purchase voice insurance. Strangely, since as a young man, he sold insurance in part to help pay for voice lessons. Number 7. Troy Polamalu's Hair 
Troy Polamalu, though of American Samoan descent, was born and raised not in that U.S. territorial possession, but in Southern California and Oregon. He excelled in football as well as basketball in high school and entered the University of Southern California in 1999. At some juncture during his college career, he quit having his hair cut. He drew sufficient attention from the NFL to be chosen in the first rounds of the 2003 draft, the 16th overall pick by the Pittsburgh Steelers. Beginning in the 2003 season, Polamalu drew attention for both his on-field performance and for the steadily increasing length of his hair. He claims to have not had a haircut since 2010. His growing hair and notoriety as a hard-hitting defensive back led Head & Shoulders Shampoo to hire Polamalu to market their product in television print commercials. In 2010, Procter & Gamble, manufacturer of Head & Shoulders products, insured Polamalu's hair for a million dollars with Lloyd's. According to the Guinness Book of World Records, the amount of insurance on Polamalu's locks was a world record. In 2013, the football star dropped Head & Shoulders and endorsed a competitor product. He later returned to endorse the Procter & Gamble product, though whether whether his Samoan warrior hairstyle remains insured by Lloyds is uncertain. Number 6. The Taylor Burton Diamond during their high visibility relationship, which included two marriages and divorces, numerous public squabbles, and more than one interloper on both sides, actor Richard Burton became notorious for the jewelry which he lavished upon Elizabeth Taylor. There were many stunning pieces. In 1968, he gave Taylor a 33 carat diamond, formerly owned by Vera, wife of steel magnate Alfred Krupp. That rock was more or less daily wear for the actress. She wore it on set as a ring, usually on her right hand. The most famous of the diamonds given to Taylor by Richard Burton was the stone known as the Taylor Burton Diamond. 69 9.42 carats, which he acquired in 1969. Burton had the diamond fitted into a necklace, in part to help cover Elizabeth's tracheotomy scar. Miss Taylor deemed it appropriate to wear at the 40th birthday celebration for Princess Grace of Monaco. She thoughtfully wore the crypt diamond as well, no doubt in Princess Grace's honor. The Burtons took out insurance on the mammoth stone through Lloyd's, which added stipulations to its wear in public. Lloyd stipulated that diamond could only be worn in public when armed security guards were available and limited its number of appearances per year. The stone was insured for a million dollars. After acquiring the diamond, Burton and Taylor divorced, subsequently remarried, and divorced a second time. Following the second divorce, Taylor sold the diamond in 1979 to a New York jeweler. Number 5. The Hindenburg The German airship Hindenburg is primarily remembered for the dramatic manner in which it blew up in Lakehurst, New Jersey in 1937. It did so on film, accompanied by a frantic broadcast describing its destruction, and it has since become a symbol of complete disaster. The incident was doubly stunning, because up until then, Hindenburg had a reputation of reliable and comfortable transatlantic transportation, rivaling that of ocean steamers in comfort, but considerably faster. The preceding year, its first in scheduled service, Hindenburg made 10 crossings of the Atlantic without incident. Airships seemed poised to claim a prominent share of transatlantic traffic. Although heavier-than-air service was much faster than the airships, with Pan American Airways flying their clippers from Europe to the US, the airships offered luxurious accommodations that airplanes could not. Germany's Zeppelin Airline Company operated two Zeppelins between Europe and the Americas before the Hindenburg disaster, which, along with German aggression in Europe, spelled the end of commercial lighter-than-air passenger flights. The 36 dead from the Hindenburg disaster, the exact cause of which has never been determined, were the only casualties of the transatlantic airship era. The Germans had ensured their operations through Lloyds appropriately since they followed a model built around maritime operations. That itself is no surprise, given the British company's long experience providing transoceanic insurance. Despite the lack of finding a liability for the disaster, Lloyds paid the claims for the loss of the Hindenburg, almost $80 million in today's money. A copy of the 10-page insurance documents can be seen at the New York City Fire Museum in Manhattan. Number 4. America Ferreira's Smile Actress America Ferreira first achieved fame for her portrayal of Betty Suarez in the television comedy Ugly Betty, a role that she held from 2006 to 2010. Among the affectations of the role were unkempt hair and eyebrows and the scourge of teenage dental care, a full set of braces. Betty, though, was not a teenager, but a young woman in her early 20s, trapped by her job in the world of high fashion. Despite her appearance in her role as Betty Suarez, or maybe because of it, America Ferreira found herself in demand for an advertising campaign for a teeth whitening product in 2008. Aquafresh white trays manufactured by GlaxoSmith Klein hired Ms. Ferreira to model her smile sans Betty's braces, with a portion of the profits going to Smiles for Success, which supports women unable to afford dental care. To minimize the risk of losing America's smile, it was insured for $10 million. To provide the insurance, the group turned to Lloyd's, which underwrote the smile of an actress who gained her fame through a smile featuring braces prominently. The insurance covers the actress's teeth and gums, and in essence provides her with full coverage dental insurance for the duration of the policy. Dental insurance is, after all, at least more commonly encountered than chest hair insurance, and it is really the association with Ugly Betty's braces more than America Ferreira's smile which renders the policy unusual. Number 3. RMS Titanic 
In the 1997 film Titanic, a Renault automobile plays a prominent role. It serves as a place of, shall we say, temporary sanctuary for Rose and Jack while deep in the hold of the ship. There really was a Renault of similar appearance on the ill-fated ship, a luxury model known as a Type CB Coupe de Ville owned by William Carter. Mr. Carter survived the sinking of the Titanic, as did his family traveling with him. His automobile did not, though it served as the inspiration and scene for an impassioned handprint as the fictional version of the sinking began. The real-life Mr. Carter filed a claim for the loss of his vehicle with White Star Line, the owner and operator of the Titanic. They passed it on to their insurer, which honored the claim, as it did for all of the claims submitted in the aftermath of the loss of the ship. Mr. Carter received $5,000 in compensation for his lost car, paid to him by Lloyds, which had underwritten the vehicle through its insurance of the ship. White Star Line paid a premium of roughly £7,500, that's $1.13 million, to insure Titanic and its contents on its maiden voyage. The risk spread out among several of its syndicates. It paid out over £1 million that's $152 million today in the aftermath of the disaster, nearly all claims were paid within 30 days of the loss of the ship. The speed with which the claims were paid is yet another stunning fact of the Titanic disaster, at least when looked at from the perspective of the 21st century. Number 2. The 1906 San Francisco Earthquake The 1906 San Francisco Earthquake was much more than just a massive seismological event. It was an earthquake, of course. It was also a major urban conflagration along the lines of the more famous Chicago Fire. It was a complete breakdown of emergency services is an urban crisis in the days when the federal government had no means of rendering assistance beyond the use of the military, and many of the insurance companies providing coverage for damages in the region were financially incapable of honoring their obligations. Even today, most insurance policies do not cover earthquake damage. But following the 1906 San Francisco earthquake, Lloyds issued instructions, Cuthbert Heath again, to its syndicates to pay all claims for damages caused by the quakes and ensuing fires, irrespective of the terms of their policies. Many insurance companies went bankrupt rather than pay claims. Lloyds paid the equivalent of over a billion dollars to claimants following the disaster in San Francisco. Of course, to refer to the event as the disaster in San Francisco is a misnomer, as the quake and its aftermath affected a huge part of the United States, from Oregon to central Nevada to Los Angeles. The San Francisco earthquake and fire of 1906 remained the single largest loss for Lloyds until the terrorist attacks of 9-11, after which payment of claims was considerably less streamlined. Even so, Lloyds' response to the terrorist attack earned praise from government officials, including American Secretary of the Treasury John Snow, who acknowledged that we are indebted to you. Number 1. Contests and Rewards Cutty Sark once ran a contest in 1971, offering £1 million to whoever delivered the or a Loch Ness Monster. When executives raised concerns they may actually have to pay the award to some intrepid Nessie hunter, they approached Lloyds to cover the award. Lloyds agreed after specifying the dimensions of the captured animal, establishing its bona fides through the Natural History Museum, and establishing the captured monster would become the property of Lloyds. Nessie remains elusive more than 50 years later, and the contest has long since expired. Lloyds has also ensured against paying out winners of other contests. Who Wants to Be a Millionaire paid a Lloyds brokerage to cover the top prize, £1 million on the original British version of the game show. At the time the program began airing in the United States, the top prize had never been won. After two contestants won the American equivalent top prize of a million dollars during the first season, the Lloyds brokerage group Goshawk Syndicate sued, claiming the US version had been deliberately made too easy to win. The American version was, to their minds, too easy for the brokers to assume the financial risks. Lloyds brokers were willing to assume reasonable risks, but evidently they saw no reason to be stupid about it. As an example of the less challenging nature of the questions on the American version of the program, the Daily Telegraph ran sample questions, including this from the US program. Which condiment is also known as a Latin dance? Mustard, mayonnaise, relish, or salsa? A cited question from the British version was, what is the SI unit of magnetic flux density? For those who need the answers, they are respectively Salsa and Tesla. Maybe Lloyd's Syndicate had a bit of a point.